Um, we'll get started now because I don't want to waste anybody's time. But <clears throat> looks like it's time to get started. So welcome to Designing Impactful Lessons, your guide to understanding by design stage three. Also, welcome to the webinar office hours. If you have not attended one of these before, it is fast paced. It's an intense 30 minute professional development webinar that is hopefully also a lot of fun. Um, grab your smartphone devices. Um, we're going to use those to scan QR codes to help us interact with one another and learn with and from each other. However, if you are distracting a child with your phone or your phone's upstairs or whatever the situation is, I will also be throwing links in the chat box so you can access them that way. All right, so before we get started real quick, um, in the chat box, I threw the certificate for today. If you just joined and you want to download that, that's totally fine. If you're having any issues, please let me know and I will make sure that we get it to you. OK, so we're just going to jump right in. So scan the QR code using the camera on your phone. And then if you give me a hot second, because I'm not great at talking while posting links in the chat box, you can also use the link in the chat box. This will take you to a tool called Mentimeter, and we're going to answer the question, what are some of your favorite instructional strategies? So this could be thumbs up, thumbs down. This could be fist to five. This could be four corners. So whatever you prefer to use, your favorites, your go-tos, whatever they are, and you can scan the QR code or the link in the chat box should work. If we're having any issues, please feel free to let me know. Some, as you know, teaching without having a technology issue is pretty rare. So when it opens, you should be able to type your response, click submit. We're going to use a strategy called Word Cloud. So if you've never used one of these before, when you type your response, that's typically one word, we generate a word cloud. The words get bigger the more they're typed. They get smaller the less often they're typed. And then you can do fun things like change the color to get students interested. Um, so Mentimeter is a great free interactive tool for educators. You can answer as many times as you want to, by the way. So if you're like, but I have so many, throw them all in there. So Mentimeter is our interactive tool that's great for collaboration. Um, and check with your IT department to make sure you have access to it before you decide to use it with you or your students. OK, so some of our favorite instructional strategies, think, pair, share. That's awesome. I love that one, too. Listening. Tough one. Quick writes, word walls. All these are fantastic. OK, we will get to the reason why I asked you that question in a little bit. So in stage three. Ooh, projects. Yep. Uh, active listening. Oh, that one's hard, too. I taught middle school and that was a uh, that was a rarity. <laughs> so in stage three, teachers plan learning experiences and their instruction. And we're like finally at the good stuff. So we've talked about all that previous stuff. And I don't know about you guys, but the learning activities were kind of like my bread and butter when I was teaching. I loved creating the learning activities. I loved watching my students get excited. I like watching when that understanding moment occurs. And stage three is where teachers decide what effective and engaging activities are going to occur? In what order are we going to teach them in so that we know students are meeting the identified results and they have the skills and knowledge to perform well on our performance tasks? And then to ensure that every student is learning, Wiggins and McTighe, the researchers for understanding by design, have encouraged teachers to one, vary their type of instructional methods, Make sure learning activities are not student are student centered, but not teacher centered, and that they foster collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity, which all of ours on our instructional strategy word wall so far do wonderful. Group inquiry. Oh, my science heart is so happy. All right. So learning activities should, according to Charles Stewart University in Australia's Division of Learning and Teaching. All learning activities should align to outcomes and assessments, engage students in effective and active learning, facilitate to practice of core skills and use of knowledge prior to assessments, provide feedback on student progress towards learning outcomes, and be accessible for all students. So 
Now that we have some background information on stage three, planning our learning experiences and instruction, and we're kind of getting back in that understanding of the design, understanding by design mindset. My name is Meredith Llewellyn. I'm the instructional design specialist here at GW Publisher. Um, my experience, in case you haven't been on one of these, I was a classroom teacher for about 14 years in middle school. I was a technology and LMS trainer, PD pr uh, presenter focusing on effective pedagogy, and now I am instructional designer. So that's a little bit about me. Our goals today, because it's important for learning and engagement to know our goals and the rationale behind it, we're going to talk about our learning outcomes for this session. So today, you will know how to ensure all st students are learning. You'll be able to use an acronym called WHERE TO to design learning activities. You'll be able to use a variety of engagement and instructional strategies and formative assessments, and you'll analyze your own practice and how you can incorporate stage three into your current practice. All right, so because I've just jabbered at you for a little bit, it's now time to get you guys back to engage. We're gonna do a strategy called one paper or one pager. I'm having a hard time talking today, guys. <laughs> so scan the QR code using the camera on your phone or there's a link that I'm going to post in the chat box and give me a second because this is not my strong suit. OK, so here's the link in the chat box. Um, and you can click on it. It's going to take you back to Mentimeter, but it's going to ask you two separate questions. The two separate questions are going to be what makes a student fully engaged? And when are learners the most productive. So when it opens, you can type your answer and then click submit. And it'll start generating our answers. So you can access it either in the code in the scan the code or click on the link in the chat box. So when are students most fully engaged or what makes them so engaged? And when is student learning most effective? And what conditions lead to that highest quality of work produced by the learners? Are a couple different ways you could think about it. So um, you may be thinking like time of day. When I taught middle school, they were rarely paying attention after lunch. So having that post lunch class was always a little rough or the first thing in the morning for 13 year olds can get a little dicey. So. When are they the most engaged? It could be time of day. It could be during your lesson. It could be what you're doing with your lesson, an instructional strategy. Anything that comes to mind when you think what makes students fully engaged? And then when are learners the most productive? So what have you done to help make them productive? What is naturally occurring around them to make them the most productive? All right, so we have relevant content that is interesting for the subject. 100%. When activities build on prior knowledge and connect to personal experiences, A pluses, yes, all around. Both of those are absolutely fantastic. So students, if they can't connect to it, it's, it's already kind of boring for them. And if they don't find it interesting, they're probably checking out pretty fast. All right, so feel free to keep responding. But in the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving. Ooh, when they're actively working toward the learning goal, yep, with interesting, authentic activities. Oh, authenticity, you got, you got it. OK, so a good learning activity ensures that everybody is learning. And how do we make it more likely that everyone will understand? How do we ensure that everyone is learning? Because that's a tall order. So first, we need to think about what the students will need to achieve those desired results and to do well on their performance task. Not unfortunately what we want to do as the teacher. Questions we can ask ourselves to help focus on those student needs are what learning activities and teaching promote understanding, knowledge, skills, and student interest? Given the desired results and the performance task, what kind of instructional approaches and resources are required to achieve our goals? And what is the best use of our time spent in and out of the classroom given these goals? So first we start off by asking ourselves questions. Second, 
all learning activities must be engaging to all students and they need to be effective. If you don't hook those student attentions, as you guys noticed when you were saying, when are they the most engaged and most productive, you have to hook their attention and hold it. That's the hard part. So if you don't, you've already lost the battle. According to McTighe and Wiggins, students are most engaged when work is hands-on. It involves some kind of mystery, some intrigue. It allows for competition and or collaboration, and it simulates real world activities and situations. These learning activities have to also be effective. They can't just be engaging. So McTigg and Wiggins have identified that work is most effective when the goal is clear. So students know why they're doing it and they know the purpose. When I taught middle school, that was the number one question I heard is why are we doing this, right? They also need to see examples and models. And we also have a situation called non-examples, which are the not necessarily bad examples, but they're the not correct examples. They need to limit the fear of failure for them. So the fear of failure, a lot of people think is a driving factor, but in fact, it's going to limit a lot of students' ability to be effective. And they need to have time for self-assessment and reflection. So to ensure that all students are learning, uh, Wiggins and McTighe encourage teachers to differentiate and use scaffolding. And John Hattie supported this in his study on influences and effect sizes related to student achievement. That's his big meta analysis study that he did and has updated a couple of times. And he found that scaffolding had an effect size of 0.82 compared to 0.4. And that means that in it, scaffolding is the top 15 of 250 other influences on students learning, which is huge. Scaffolding provides support to help students progress and then it gradually removes the assistance as understanding grows to promote that independent learning and self-efficacy we want them to develop. So you can think of this like riding a bike. Kids start with a tricycle, then they move to a bike with training wheels, then you take off the training wheels and you hold on to them and help them, and then you let them go, right? So that's your scaffolding situation. You've also seen this quite a bit in math and English in particular, foreign language. Um, and in education, we typically refer to it as I do, we do, and then you do. And then we get to differentiation, which is not the same as scaffolding. So to differentiate means to modify your instruction to meet those individual needs and accommodate di diverse learners and abilities and styles to ensure that every student is succeeding in your classroom. Now, some of these are fairly obvious, such as learners with visual or physical or hearing impairments, and some of them are less apparent. So providing a choice board or a choice of book for varying interests, giving instructions in a variety of ways, allowing students who have already mastered the material to do extension projects or many lessons for students who are still struggling. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked a little bit about that, I wanna know what are some of your formative assessments you like to use? So you can scan the QR code, or I'm going to post the link in the chat box here. And it's going to take you back to Mentimeter. And we're going to do a strategy called a brain dump. So you're just going to, from your brain, dump all formative assessments that you like to use. So you can list as many as you want. You can do one, you can do 10. So what are some formative assessments you like? This could be fist to five. This could be thumbs up, thumbs down. This could be stand up, sit down, red light, green light, whatever your favorites are. And this can be really, I like to use these where I'm asking for your guys' feedback because this is our opportunity as educators. We don't always get a chance to talk to fellow educators and fellow adults. And it's nice to hear what other people have to say because sometimes you find a strategy that's like really awesome and exciting and you've never heard of it before and it's now your new favorite or your students really like it. Um, okay, so Mark said reading checkpoints, short answer questions focused on the main idea. Fantastic, Mark. I love those. It's 
So some formative assessments you like to use. I'm going to wait a couple more seconds, give you guys time to type. All right, we have thumbs up, Google practice sets. Oh, those are fun. I, I forgot about those. Gamified activities, those are great. Um, Bob said written or oral quizzes, those are fantastic. Um, gamified activities, you could do Kahoot, you can do Quizlet, you can do quizzes, you can do GimKit. There's a whole slew of different um, ed tech programs that are now doing gamified activities. Um, so if you're interested in using those, you just have to do a quick search. Most of them have free trials or free um, plans that you can utilize. All right, so according to NWEA, formative assessment is a planned ongoing process used by all students and teachers, because students get stuff out of this, during, less, during learning and teaching to elicit and use evidence of student learning and to improve student understanding. Now that's kind of a mouthful, but that's their definition. And there should be reminders, multiple formative assessments per lesson. So when I taught, I would start with a bell ringer, which can be a type of formative assessment. Teach for five to 10 minutes because middle schoolers don't have a large attention span. Do another formative assessment, teach for about five to 10 minutes, do another formative assessment and repeat until we get to the end of class when I would do an exit slip as another type of formative assessment. And on average, I would give about four formative assessments a day minimum. So formative assessments should be used at different points throughout your lesson to gather a variety of data and information to help you and your student inform themselves and make a real snapshot of what the student is learning and understanding. So some characteristics of this are monitor student learning, it should occur during lessons. It should be informal. These are typically not for points. They're really quick. And there should be theoretically very little preparation needed, but those gamified activities can take a little bit longer. And then they provide immediate feedback. This varies from our summative assessments, which are usually the exact opposite. The largest differences being that summative assessments are planned and they occur at the end of the unit, and they usually are formal with usually quite a few points attached. So now we get to how do I put all of this into my lesson? How do I design a good lesson, right? According to Understanding by Design, how do I follow their stuff? So lessons, first of all, as a reminder, should ultimately be teaching those knowledge and skills needed on the performance task. They should be showing that students are gaining that transferable knowledge or skills and that they can use them appropriately. They should also give opportunities to practice how to take a test and how you're going to give them feedback so that they know what's going to happen. A performance task and situation should be new, but the process should never be new. They shouldn't be learning the process of the test as they're taking the test. The best learning activities are designed to have, and this is a long list, which is why we're gonna learn our acronym, clear performance goals. They need to use hands-on approaches. They should focus on interesting and important ideas. They should have real world applications. They should utilize feedback systems. They should show clear models and examples and allow time for self-assessment. And that's a lot to do in one lesson every day. However, Wiggins and McTighe have come up with an acronym to help remember those important instructional elements, and the acronym is called WHERE TO. So each of those letters stands for something, and let's break it down. The W refers to where it's going and why. So this is where educators clearly communicate their goals and provide the rationale for the learning. This is where you answer the students' questions, why are we doing this? What's the point? And then to help personalize and truly explain where they're going. This is the point to gather that information you guys talked about earlier with the prior knowledge and get that prior knowledge and experience from students. Where are they coming from? What interests do they have? What misconceptions are they carrying about your subject? 
And at this point, it's also beneficial to tell them about their end task and situation so that they can plan their learning as they go. They know where they're going, right? They're not wandering aimlessly down a path. The H refers to hooking that student's attention and holding it. So by hooking that student, you're triggering their intrinsic motivation, which helps them to be more engaged and creates more effective learning. And then some examples of engagement openers that you could use would be a question or a problem. You can even open with a logic puzzle if you're doing something like that, or a regular puzzle. Tasks such as role playing, case studies, mysteries, common real world examples. So students love those good mysteries, right? Especially unsolved ones that we still don't know to this day. And that helps them get excited and engaged, which you guys had mentioned earlier. The biggest factor is going to be using the information from that W stage to make it personal. And you guys nailed that on the head when you said you need to have that personal connection that the students can make. The more they relate, the more engaged they stay. So the first E refers to explore and equip. In this area, you're equipping and enabling learners with the tools they'll need during that performance task. This is where you ask yourself what kind of knowledge, skills, habits of mind are prerequisites for a successful final performance. And what kind of instructional activities am I going to use to help them understand these key ideas? R refers to rethink and revise. How will we as educators encourage students to reflect on their learning performances? So first, we need to make sure they know that that's even what they should be doing. Because, right, sometimes students don't even know that that's what they should be doing. Then we need to bring them back to that original idea or skill that we were trying to get them to understand in the first place. And that's how they're going to eventually keep revising and rethinking from that original idea to get that deep and meaningful understanding. The second E refers to exhibit and evaluate. This brings us to the idea of self-evaluation and adjustment. We all know that the most successful people in the world have the ability to self-reflect and adjust, but not only that, they do it timely and they do it in an effective manner. So students need to learn this skill. They need to learn to reflect on what's working, what's not working, and how can I do it better? So let me quick ways to do this in your teaching are set aside five minutes at the end of class and have them reflect on their learning in the lesson. This is usually an exit slip or maybe a discussion at the end of class. And you can also put a self-assessment at the end of every project and have them evaluate themselves and assess themselves before you do. You can have peer assessments, peer graded, so they have a self-assessment, peer assessment, your assessment. You can have students track their pre and post data. You can even make it a small assignment for points. You can have them do graphs. You can have them do tables, but that gets them more involved in where they're going. Um, at the beginning of class, you can survey their questions they have and then have them reflect back on it at the end of class. I will say practice this a lot because at first you're going to get a lot of crazy outlandish questions and they need to learn to hone those questions. T refers to tailor. We need to tailor our teaching to students' needs and interests. This is where we scaffold and differentiate. To do this effectively, we need to know that prior knowledge, right? What are student interests? What are misconceptions they have? What are their gaps in knowledge? And are there any specific learning needs they may have? So differentiation can occur in a variety of ways. You can give a variety of materials, such as different leveled reading materials, or ways to interact with that material. You can give a variety of inf like information in a variety of ways, like um, you can use orally, visually, written. You can give them choice boards with the same rubric, so they have multiple different ways of doing the activity, but they're all evaluated the same way. Lastly, O refers to organizing for maximum engagement and effectiveness. Learning plans should be organized, so that students move back and forth between the whole task, then the part of the task, and then back to the whole task. So think of a sport like basketball. They start with the whole game. You teach them a skill like running while dribbling, and then they're taught, they go back to that whole game, right? All right. 
And throughout this, you should be reminding your students about why so that they stay engaged. Okay, last tip of the day, because I know we're running short on time, is to vary your instructional method and strategies, which is why I had you guys list some of your instructional strategies at the beginning that you like to use. Varying your instructional method means you're rotating between direct instruction, that lecturing, facilitated instruction, you directly helping the students and coaching. You're more like the guide on the side, right? You're helping them from a distance. All of these methods are great to use, but using one more often than the others is going to cause you to be ineffective. It's also important to know when to use them, but that's really personal. That's you and your students and your materials that you use. And then lastly, vary those instructional strategies. We all have our favorites. Trust me, I have my ones I love to use, but varying them can actually increase your students' engagement more, and you might find one that you love way more. Um, we had the ones we shared, but you can also go to a website called K20 Learn. It's really fantastic. It has, I don't even know, hundreds of instructional strategies broken down. You can search through them. It gives you a little card on how to, what it is, and how much time it takes. And that's really awesome. I encourage you all to use that if you want to. Um, all right. Lastly, our exit slip for today, scan the QR code using the camera on your phone, or I'm going to post our last link for today. And it is going to take us to Mentimeter again. And it's going to ask us to assess how am I feeling and what am I thinking? Okay, right? Just a quick assessment. If you want to type in full sentences, you can. If you just want to type out short word responses, that's totally fine, however works for you. So how am I feeling and what am I thinking? This is a great reflection strategy to get you thinking about what you've just learned because it also helps you process that information and make that connection to your personal learning and yourself. So a lot of times we have a feeling about something or we're thinking about something, but we don't get a chance to fully process that. And this is going to, that's a great opportunity for students to take a pause and think, how am I feeling about that lesson? Um, I always like hearing new ideas to incorporate my methods. That's good. So I guess that's what you're thinking, feeling good, happy. And don't forget, you can scan the QR code or click on the link. If neither of those are working, I love how Mark and Bob use the chat box. That's always an option, and I forgot to say that, so thank you guys for knowing that and doing that. Um, refreshed, interested, and backwards designed for small activities as well as large projects. That makes me feel so good, thanks. Feeling great, love the K20 site. It is awesome, highly recommend it. I hadn't heard of it, and I was like, oh my gosh, where was this when I was teaching? And then I probably shared it with all of my teacher friends. Um, important to try some of these strategies, yeah. They're great. I mean, they really are fun strategies. They're hard to use sometimes at first, getting out of that habit, but they are really fun, I promise. Okay, so to keep um, aware of your guys' time, when implementing understanding design, because this is our last series. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm so sad to leave you. Um, when implementing understanding by design, there's a couple of things to remember. It's backwards from how we normally think about things. You have to start with identifying your desired results then go to your acceptable evidence and finally the learning activities and instruction and experience. Understanding by design is meant to be utilized collaboratively. It's very overwhelming if you think about doing this independently. This really is something that we encourage educators to do as a group. It's a lot to do with just one person and almost too much. And then understanding by design has the flexibility to adapt to all of our different subjects and grade levels. And a quick reminder, I know we're all, this is the thing that I hated to hear the most as a teacher. Educators need to be conducting those ongoing reflections and adjusting our teaching to those. It's so hard when you have your lessons planned and timed out and you have a lot of time and state testing and accreditation. And then they tell you to adjust on the fly. I hated hearing that, but it is really important. And then recapping, we learned to ensure that all students are learning. We learned how to use where to to plan our um, learning activities. 
We learned about a variety of strategies for engagement and instruction. We analyzed really quickly how we were feeling, a couple different ways we could incorporate it like as soon as tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, we used Mentimeter as our technological tool and we did our strategies word cloud, one pager, brain dump, and how am I feeling, what am I thinking? Um, quick reminder, if you could please scan the QR code and I'm gonna put the evaluation link in the chat box. This is to evaluate today's PD webinar and it is um, really good for me to hear back. I taught middle school for 14 years. You're not gonna break my heart by telling me something, but the feedback I do personally read and it helps me make these webinars a lot better. Um, so if you scan that QR code or click on the link in the chat box, it's about six questions. Um, shouldn't take you too long. We love feedback at GW. I love the feedback. It's great for me to read, um, figure out how I can improve. And also, if you have any topics you want to know about in webinars, you have something you're really dying to hear about, you just don't have time to do the research for, put that in and maybe we'll get to it. We actually love finding new things you guys are interested in. It really does help us tailor because this is for you guys. And then um, certificate, I did put that in the chat box. If it's not working, please let me know. Sometimes it doesn't work and we're not really sure why. Sometimes it works great. Um, so if you clicked on that and it's not working, just put in the chat box or email me and we will make sure you get it. And lastly, you will be receiving a recording um, within 24 hours of this webinar. So if there was something on there that you wanted and we just moved too fast or you want to pause, you're more than welcome to. Then if you didn't get a chance to do the eval, it's still there, it's in the green box and the uh, link is still in the chat. So you can keep evaluating if you need to. Um, but next week, we're going to do something a little different and kind of exciting. If you scan the QR code or click the last link that I'm going to put in the chat box, I promise, last one, um, this will register you for our three-part replay of the Understanding by Design series. Um, we'll also be sending it out in an email from GW with the PD registration link. So if you don't know if you can make it now or you don't have time or you got to check on things, we will also be sending it out in an email. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming today. These are some of my favorite times of the day. There's so much fun to interact with you guys. I love hearing about all the stuff you're utilizing and learning and things you can share with us because it's so great to learn from our fellow educators and get to share with them. So thank you again, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, rest of your week, and next week you'll get the link to those replay videos if you have anything you want to review. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, I'm Meredith Llewellyn. I'm the Instructional Design Specialist here at GW Publisher. Um, have a great day, and thank you so much for coming out. Have a good one.